inviting me. Uh, so I'll talk about, uh, yes, my work prior to KML. But, uh, maybe I'll come back to LISP someday. Um, so, so I'll talk about a verified LISP impl implementation for a verified theorem prover. And this is joint work with Jared Davis, but also builds on a lot of other people's work. Um, so I put here Centaur Technology in Cambridge, because that's where we were when this work was done. Nowadays, I'm at Chalmers, and Jared is at Apple. Okay. So this is the, the sort of headline result, and this is the claim about it, uh, that this verified list implementation combined with the verified theorem prover is the most comprehensive proof-based evidence of the theorem prover soundness to date. Um, so this, uh, although it doesn't show in the title, we're really proving us uh, something about the soundness of the logic of the prover uh, and relating that to how machine code for the implementation runs on x86. So it's really end-to-end -end in that sense. Uh, but this talk won't be about the final product, but rather about the journey there. So uh, I'll talk about, I'll start from my PhD days and say how the exploration kind of ended up here and a little bit about where it continued onwards from there. Uh, this was not the aim when I started. Uh, rather, I was just exploring. And the theme was how to make uh, verification scale. So that was the theme of this exploration and the result, one of the results was that uh, verified prover. So this will be, I'll start from this. So I was a PhD student and my task was to do verification of machine code and at this stage when I started it took a week at least to verify factorial as well four lines of machine code. Uh, similar length for length of list, a linked list, it's, it is a lot of work. So I'll, I'll zoom out a little bit, context. So I did my PhD in Cambridge and my supervisor was Mike Gordon. Uh, he's, he's a He's uh, the originator of the whole prover. So I'm using the whole prover, and what is that? It's a fully expansive theorem prover. This means that it has a small kernel, and the prover implemented, so small as in a few thousand lines, uh, and then the prover itself is built on top of this kernel, and it's organized in such a way that every proof that you do must pass through the, the kernel. Uh, kernel's inferences, and the kernel implements the inference rules of higher logic. And my task was to prove deep functional properties of machine code. So, uh, so working with these, I don't know how many of you have worked with these, but it, uh, Larry Paulson likes to use this kind of picture of it. That because you have to fit everything through this little kernel, it, it feels like building one of these ships because uh, it's rather difficult to do that. So, the topic was machine code. So I. I had to deal with this kind of thing. This is the GCD program. It's uh, very beautiful in ARM assembly. Only uh, ARM machine code, only four instructions. But of course, it's very clear that this is not readable, writable, or maintainable for humans, at least. Um, however, I found out that for the theorem proving based formal verification, I would say machine code is clearly intractable. And there's a few reasons for this. Uh, it's very simple. All types are very concrete. Uh, it's very simple in that way. The state consists of only a few components. Uh, memory, some registers, status bits, and a few other things. Uh, each instruction performs a very small, well-defined updates on the step. So in that sense, it's very simple. Uh, the challenge with machine code is that if you're given some machine code, so what we saw previously, and you have some correctness statement you want to prove about it, is that what does, what's the meaning of this? And that's the hard part. Suddenly you have to deal with these thousand line definition of what it means to run ARM machine code. And, and not only is there ARM machine code, there's x86, there's PowerPC, there's MIPS, and so forth. So there are several, several large detailed models that seem to be different in ad hoc ways. Uh, the code is unstructured and very low level and has limited resources. So you can't assume that natural numbers, that a variable contains a natural number which is unbounded. So, 
So during my PhD, I developed the following infrastructure, and this is what ultimately was used to produce that uh, list implementation. So at the bottom, we have the machine specifications. These were not written by me. Uh, some of them were translated by me, but not, not written by me. Um, on top of this, I put a programming logic. On top of this, I add proof automation. I'll talk about those in a little bit. First of all, let's look at what these models look like. So each model evaluates uh, instructions. So here we have a theorem that describes what it means to evaluate this instruction on a specific ARM platform. So let me read this. This is a bit of a mess. But first of all, there's an assumption. The assumption says the state is not in an undefined state. It, the processor hasn't got stuck yet. Uh, so here, you need to read from memory. Look up what the value of uh, register 15 is. That's the program counter. Take the top 30 bits from it. Read that memory address from memory. And if you get this value, then we're talking about that instruction. So if that is there in memory, then we're talking about this instruction. And that means that the next ARM MMU state, so next function state, changes state in the following way. It writes to register 15, the program counter. It adds, a, adds plus 4 to it. And it writes to register 0, the value of register 0, plus the value of register 0. So this is very low level. And this was a simple instruction. For memory stores, you have much more. And you can have store multiple in, uh, in R. So first thing I did was write <coughs> specifications for these. So here we have a specification for that instruction saying that if you start in a state where register 0 has value x and program counter has p, p points at that instruction, then after executing it, you'll be in a place where register 0 has x plus x, just what you'd expect. Those are added, assigned there, and then the program counter gets plus 4. So why is that 4? Because there's 4 bytes in one of these. Uh, so you go one word forward in memory. And uh, here's the definition. So I want to, uh, this is the only point, maybe the only point in the talk, the talk you'll see the definition uh, and or us making use of it. So what this means is that if the, uh, the precondition is true, some frame holds and the code is also there separately in the state. So this is separation logic star, I think. Code separate, yes. Then some point later, so this is total correctness, some point later the program, uh, the execution will reach uh, a state where the same holds except that Q is there. So in particular, the code is still the same. So we, we know that we can then execute more code. Uh, total correctness. And that's where the next state function is hidden. Yes. So this logic can be used directly for verification, but it is rather tired, tiresome to use directly. Uh, it will take about a day, even with uh, good automation, to do something like factorial in a theorem group, if you use this manual. So for this reason, I developed some tools for. So here's uh, what I call a, a decompiler. So given some machine code, so we have the machine code here. I just write so that it's a little bit more readable. I write the assembly there, but this is really the input to the, the tool. So what does this machine code do? It moves a constant into register 0, it compares uh, register 1 with 0, then it conditionally executes add, load, and branch to the top. So there's add and load from that address and branch to the top. Uh, the decompiler tool, given this, produces uh, a readable function that tries to summarize what this is doing. So, uh, uh, so you can see here that f corresponds to entering at 0, and g corresponds to entering at 4. So f, we assign 0 to r0, we compare r1 with 0, f compare, and then we add 1, load, and recurse with l. So it's, it's the same thing. 
it's computing the same, same result, uh, but how do we know that? Well, because the decompiler is proof producing, so it, it also proves this. So this is one of those hot ripples we saw before. Uh, so this one says that if uh, initially R0, R1, and M, these are variables, describe the states, then after executing it, you'll get that F describes those components. So that's F was the function that was derived. And we also get this precondition that says that uh, it essentially just collects side conditions, for instance, that the memory loads are actually hitting good addresses and that we terminate. So how does one use this? This tool can be used as follows. So if we have, we want to prove a property about the machine code, then it's enough to prove a property about the function f. So here, if we have a predicate saying that some abstract list is represented at address a in memory m, then we can, if we can prove that f is indeed the length of the abstract list, and that this precondition also means that the side conditions are met, then we can easily well, combine this with the certificate theorem we got from the decompiler and say that that actually is a property of the machine code. And then another uh, interesting thing is, if someone gives us x86 and PowerPC code, which I just write like that, I don't give the assembly for it, uh, if it happens to decompile to functions that, that are, are uh, near identical to f, then you can just reuse these proofs. Even though x86 has completely different register names uh, and has fewer registers, and PowerPC, uh, the code might be quite different. For instance, the load and add might be the other way around in your code. But as long as you can prove that f is equal to f prime or f is equal to f double prime, then you can immediately reuse that proof, the manual proof. So this was a very nice thing. And uh, so now I'll try to illustrate a little bit how this decompilation works. So you start off splitting the code into different parts, uh, derive port ripples for each one. So this one is the add. So it, it's described by something that essentially in the, the post condition, something is the addition of two things from the precondition. This one is a shift, uh, logical shift right, uh, which is like that. And just changes that one. And this last one is returned from procedure, which just copies a return value into the program counter. So in this case, it's super simple to decompile this. You compose these together, and then you get the expression that is the decompile function. Uh, the actual decompiler uh, does a little bit, it does this much more carefully because it wants to keep the structure uh, with the let expressions. And it has if expressions and so forth. But otherwise, this is roughly what it does. It just composes everything together, reads off the function, and returns the function and the theorem it derived. That's how it works. So the implementation is an ML program that sits inside the whole for prover. So on top of the kernel, it doesn't, uh, uh, it's not inside the kernel. Uh, it fully automatically performs forward proof, so it's, it's a proof tool. It has no heuristics and no proof, dangling proof obligations other than the ones it packages up into the side conditions. Loops result in table request functions, and uh, I showed that this can be used for some uh, non-trivial examples, so a copying garbage collector, some big number library routines, and so forth. So machine code verification was, uh, was going forward. But I wanted, of course, more automation, more abstraction, uh, because proofs are, uh, it, it's harder to do a proof about code if the, proof wa uh, the code wasn't written with the proof in mind. Uh, so if all I want is verified code at the end, then maybe the tool should be producing the code rather than uh, the programmer producing the code and then trying to prove it. So, so I turned the decompiler around and made a compiler of it. Uh, so synthesis is more practical, uh, and I realized that if you write a function like this, something the decompiler might have produced, so 
So for instance, uh, so r is less than 10. If that's the case, then return r1. Uh, otherwise, uh, decrement by 10 and reverse. So from this description, a simple compiler can produce this assembly, which uh, uses conditional execution CS. Uh, so if this compare gives that this is less than, uh, then it just falls through these. Otherwise, it executes them and then jumps there. And a normal assembler can then turn that into uh, actual machine code. And and uh, this this tool produces this de uh, this compiler tool produces the theorems of that form as a result. So it, it produces some machine code which it guarantees with this theorem that executes the f we gave it. So how is this implemented? It's implemented by essentially just generating some code, decompiling it, and hoping we're getting to that f, and then returning whatever the decompiler gave. So there's a very nice property about this, as that f is just a normal logic function. You can just define define it in logic, and you get uh, you can, for instance, prove that it's uh, f computes the modulus of ten, not in a very efficient way, but it does it, uh, and then you can Using that theorem we got out of the <coughs> compiler, one can get, uh, one can prove a theorem like this. So, this one, if whatever value of r1 is, uh, this will make it r1 mod 10. And note that this is something that fits the way the decompiler operates. And this means that we can give, we can in the future tell the compiler, whenever you see this expression, uh, you can just use this theorem. And that's where you're teaching the compiler about new things. So, so implementation of the compiler, generate without proof code for uh, the input, you decompile and you get some other function f prime, and you're hoping you can prove that. And this is just by expanding the let expressions, and they are the same. So uh, this has various uh, nice properties. The code generation is completely unrelated to the proof. Uh, Optima you can do various little optimizations as long as you can prove that at the end. And the most significant part which we'll be using in this talk is the user-defined extensions. So, uh, so that's what we built, used for the list. This was essentially the mod example, but you can take it much further than that. So, so the idea for creating the li a Lisp implementation, in, not the, the final one, is to teach the compiler not about mod 10, but about list primitives like car, cutter, cons, and so forth. And then you give it whole functions for list parts, list eval, and list print, print string. I mean. And then you just feed it into this compiler that's implemented in terms of the decompiler, which then uses everything underneath, and out comes uh, R makes it 6 and power PC code with certificate theorems saying that, that the code that was produced implements these things. So that's one way to get a list implementation. So what is needed? So we need to formalize what S expressions are. So here's a very simple S expression. So numbers, natural numbers, uh, symbols, uh, and cons. So here, here are the logic functions. Cons just produce one of dots. Car takes the first element plus. It's in this case just defined for nouns, just produce the number. And then I defined, uh, I used my coordinate semantics for list evaluation. So this is the original list 1.5, and, uh, and uh, implemented a function to compile. Uh, function for evaluating, so. So how do we get the compiler, how do we teach the compiler about these uh, car and cons and so forth. Well, first I define this kind of list assertion, which says that these values, which are kept in registers and then also in memory in the heap, uh, are are represented uh, in in the machine. That's essentially what it says. These S expressions are represented in the machine as if they're registers. So this turns the the machine code to look like it's a 
it's a machine where S expressions are in registers. Underneath, we use the, the so cons, for instance, might call the garbage collector. This was verified previously with the decompiler. Uh, so this is actually quite a complicated thing to see, dot, dot, dot. Um, but it, it maintains this abstraction that we're just, we just have S expressions in the registers. And if you do this, then if you give these to the, to the compiler, it understands that, oh, now I can assign uh, car V1 to V2, because that's what this is doing. I also know how to implement cons V1, V2, and assignment of that into V1. So if you teach it about enough of these, then you can start programming in this or this like things. So just a reminder how this works. Uh, this one, if you imagine you plugging it in here instead, instead of getting the shift by one, you'd get a cons here, and so forth. And you just collect all the functions. Instead of these being 32-bit words, they would now be S expressions. So this produced a uh, final case study of my PhD, which was this implementation so for ARM x86 and PowerPC. And, uh, these were interpreters. I mean, there was an evaluation function implemented in this way, and that interpreted the input. So I was very happy. I could play around with it. Uh, I could run it on various little things. And I could run things like Pascal's triangle, triangle and, and uh, which is fun. But then suddenly, uh, there was like this need <laughs> of a more serious list implementation. So what happened was, that Jared Davis contacted me. I, I didn't know Jared, and for most of the time when I worked with him, I hadn't actually met him in person. But he, he sent me a message, uh, so he'd read, read about my Lisp interpreter, and he asked, can I use it? Uh, I said, sure. Uh, so he had this self-verifying theorem prover that he wants to run on it. And then, he, of course, came a lot of questions. Do you support this and that and the other thing? And I said, no. <laughs> and uh, it's not so easy to add, but uh, maybe we can work something out. We chatted a lot, and uh, we came to, uh, to realize, so he told me that he needs uh, four gigabyte input to be ready. That's four gigabytes of ASCII. That's more than a half a billion unique consoles in there. Um, and to run his bootstrap process for his theorem prover, it it takes 16 hours on state of the art system, a common, uh, common list system. And this was very clear that this is helpless with Todd. This is an interpreter. Uh, so <laughs> it's not going to manage because these are compiling uh, runtimes. So what we set off to do was to create uh, a just in time compiling uh, list implementation that's verified that with the intention of being able to host this prover. So let's take a side note about what Milava is. Milava is. It's a theorem prover in the style of ACL2 or NQ-thumb. Uh, so this is uh, in contrast to Hall, which is an LCF style prover, which has a small kernel. ACL2 does not have the small kernel. <coughs> However, Milava tries to break away from this by having a trusted small kernel in the style of LCF provers, but it tries to not have the performance implications of that uh, of those. So it has a different architecture. So LCF style provers, as I uh, mentioned previously, have one kernel or core. Uh, and on top of that, you build everything else, everything you need, and every proof goes through that kernel. But Milava has a very different approach, which it starts from a kernel, but it has a very interesting, uh, interesting primitive in there. It, it's essentially a proof checker, but which can replace its brain at runtime, so to say. So, uh, this, if you think of this as a person, uh, uh, first thing you do is you, you show it a better version of itself and say, is this safe? And then it says, oh, okay, this looks pretty good. Uh, it can't derive anything that's false. So I'll just replace myself with this one. And then you do this, you, you take another, another 
uh, slightly more perform, uh, uh, more ex well, more efficient or interesting kernel, and just replace the previous one with this one. And that way, your your tactic language suddenly becomes much more uh, much more expressive and much faster than implementation. So here at the top, you have these ACL2 style auto tactics where you just give it. Uh, give it something, it'll try induction, it'll try a bit of rewriting, a bit of case splitting, and so forth. So it's very powerful, but it starts off from something very simple. Similar auto tactics can be done here, but they're going to be slow, because they're always reduced to the primitives. So this was his big thing. And this is the bootstrap he's talking about. So can you run all the way, all the proof checking and uh, changing of the kernel up to the point where you have a fully fledged uh, Milau approval? So, I was interested in, in, in uh, knowing what, what the list implementation requires. So, I went to, uh, to ask him, what, what's it all about? So, it's, he needs consists, natural numbers, symbols, consists. That sounds easy enough. <coughs> Pretty much what I had before, cons, hardware, so forth. A few macros, it's not too scary, these macros. Um, and a very simple Lambda application form where it's fully applied. But then when we spoke a little bit more, he also needs destructive updates, hash tables, timing data, checkpoints. He needs, uh, he needs to force compilation, dynamic function calls, and runtime errors. This is what also on his requirements uh, 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 list. If you have questions, just uh, ask for our then we went through this negotiation process, and we realized he doesn't actually need these. Uh, but these ones, the runtime must have. So checkpoints he uses just to essentially stop the process once it's done, so that he has a, uh, a usable prover and doesn't have to wait the 16 hours to, again, stop his prover. Uh, destructive updates, they were just to keep state. But now we've passed state instead. So, from my point of view, uh, the most imp important thing was that the runtime must scale. It must be designed to scale. So we needed just-in-time compilation because interpretation, interpreting wouldn't work anymore. We need to compile to native code. We need to have x86, 64-bit uh, uh, x86, so that we get the heap capacity needed. Previously, I had only used 32-bit x86. Uh, we want a heap that can store 231 consoles at least, but this is our design. By design, actually, we can't uh, do more <laughs> because we, we represent each cons in a 64-bit value. Uh, so, two components. Uh, has to cope with 4 gb input. I mean, this is a... I was worried about the, the parsing being too slow if I did it naively. And uh, it has to have graceful exits. I mean, it can't run out of space. Uh, so we just have we have to report it. It's not good enough to say, or it might run out of space. It, that's not good enough. So we need to report running out of space. So the work itself, how did that go? So the, to start off with, it was quite uh, simple. It just defined the syntax and semantics of this very simple list uh, language. Uh, then I verified a compiler from source to bytecode. I'll get to what this bytecode is. I, I verified parsing and printing, and the, I used the copying language collector from before. But of course, with a different heap representation now. And then various refinements from this down to actual x86 code using the tools that were previously mentioned, and we plug everything together to get a read about printing. So this is roughly 30,000 lines of Paul Force. And this, compared to KML, for instance, uh, KML is 100,000 lines. Uh, this is quite significant still, but uh, get taken on later. So the abstract syntax tree. This actually shocked uh, uh, Jared because he th said, well, "Why don't you use S expressions for your abstract syntax tree?" So, uh, but somehow I don't work like that. <laughs> so he's, here are ML values for ML data type for the the abstract syntax tree. It's, you have constant, S expression, uh, variable application, 
if or an applied lambda, which is really just a let expression in some sense, and an or which can't be a macro because it has a bit of funky uh, behavior, but a long list of macros that just expand to these, uh, and there's various things. This is the most interesting thing. I think define that one extends the environment with a new definition. So I said I compiled this abstract syntax tree to bytecode, and this is a stack-based bytecode, uh, which most of it is pretty simple. Uh, that's most operations go in there, add, subtract, part, cons, and so forth. And the most interesting part is compile. So what does compile do? It takes something off the stack, it, it turns it into AST, conceptually at least, I mean in reality it doesn't, but, uh, and then turns it into bytecode which is installed into the running code. That's what compile does. So this is what eval compiles down to. Uh, how do we get just-in-time compilation? So we have a verified compiler algorithm, but now we need to produce real x86 code. So my trick here was to represent the bytecode instructions such that each, uh, in memory, so that each bytecode is represented by the x86 machine code that would execute it. So if you jump to the memory place where you, where you store the bytecode, you would just execute uh, the instructions of that bytecode. So that's how it's set up so that it's convenient in terms of memory management. Um, and then in the proofs, how do we deal with this? Because suddenly we have this scenario where data suddenly becomes code. And this is, a, this is something I, I worked on to uh, show that you can move some code into data and vice versa. So this is what's needed for just-in-time compilation. And if you remember the definition of the whole triple, this is not surprising at all. Uh, because here, the pre is together with the code. And if you make the code zero, then you're just switching those around. And separation conjunction is associative, associative and commutative, so you can do it. So we needed a uh, a bit of I.O. for this, we need to see routines for reading the next string from standard in and printing standard out. So this, I mean, this is not uh, particularly exciting, but in a proof context, you have to make assumptions here. So that's what we did. Um, and then the read our print loop formally, from a formal point of view, uh, you can't really say that it's a read our print loop. It just says, I read some input and I produced some output. But it, it actually interacts like a read about print loop because it's reading the input lazily and writing eagerly. That's why it, it works. Although in the specification you don't see it. Um, so this is the top level correctness theorem we got to uh, for the list implementation. Uh, so initially, you must have enough memory and I.O. assumptions must hold. Uh, and this, this is the I.O. state at that point. Each execution is allowed to fail with an out-of-memory error. I mean, whenever. So a simple implementation of this would be just say error, and that's fine. But of course, we show that you can actually bootstrap Milava without hitting this, so it's, it's a non-trivial implementation. Um, if there is no error message, then the result is described by the execution of the the top level uh, semantics of what the read about print loop should be doing. And uh, we also, because this is a total correctness for triple, we must know that this semantics actually comes to an end because it's easy to write a program for which it's uh, non terminating So we have to assume that, that this semantics terminates for that input IO, which is true for the Milago theorem. So what is this? Uh, it's just numbers, that's machine code. So this is what the verified machine code looks like. Uh, there's a lot of it. Uh, 7,000 instructions. I think that actually went up a little. Um, so then we could run it. I, I might as well if I have time. Well, I can run it, I'll show it afterwards. Uh, 
so CCL, 16 hours, SPCL, 22 hours, Chitawa was eight times slower, but that's not a surprise because Chitawa has no optimization other than tail optimization and known, I mean, if it knows what a function name refers to, it does not jump to that function. Uh, if it doesn't, then it does a dynamic function call. Uh, so it's, it's not, it's slower, definitely. But there, it, 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 interestingly, up to about two hours into this, Jitawa was only 10% slower, which surprised us very much, and we wondered what's going to happen. Uh, so maybe there's some potential getting it, even this very simple one, uh, working. So I said I was very worried about parsing. So I put a lot of effort into parsing. Uh, so Jitawa beats CCL and is nine times faster at parsing. Who I'm very, very proud of. Of course, this, these numbers kind of vanish in that. But <laughs> oh well. So the end to end result. So here we have these two things. Uh, what I've talked about so far is about how this was verified, uh, but what about this? And there's no formal connection, so there's a formal connection between this and this using that implementation, but there's nothing connecting these two. So the next thing to do is to extend, extend this onwards and formalize what the Milara logic is and prove that this kernel actually implements that logic. And uh, like that there. Okay, to prove soundness of this, to prove that with this list semantics, when you run that prover in that programming language, it respects the semantics of the logic it's trying to implement. Uh, so I could, I have just a little bit of time, if you want to see what this looks like. This is Jared's ASCII R. Uh, it's a reflective theorem prover. <laughs> reflection. So this is what it looks like. It's about 2,000 lines. So that's what we want to prove. First step was a very, uh, very basic, uh, very uh, standard exercise in interactive theorem proving. Formalize the syntax, semantics, inference rules of the Milava logic, and prove it sound. The interesting part here was, uh, well, yeah. There was, Milawa's logic is essentially Lisp, so it's a little bit funny in certain places because it has evaluation. Um, and then we proved that it's uh, faithful to the logic, and this required essentially getting that ASCII into the prover because at the end, the Lisp implementation talks about reading ASCII. So we need to somehow get that into, into the prover get a shallow embedding out of it automatically with the proof tool and then prove that each uh, feature in the proof checker is actually faithful to the logic and particularly that the switch command is faithful. That that's, was uh, maybe the most interesting part. But I don't think I have time for that. Uh, so here is the composed uh, correctness theorem. If the initial state, as we had it before, contains the Milawa kernel on input, followed by Milawa main and the four gigabyte expression, uh, then you get either an error message or you get line output that is consistent with the logic. That's, that's essentially it. A line output is either it prints a theorem, and if it prints a theorem, then that theorem has to, has to be true in the, in the semantics of Milawa. So I'm running out of time, so I'm going to quickly through this. So, uh, a better compiler compiler. So, Jitawa was produced in this, using the same tools from my PhD. So, here I inserted the compiler from AST to bytecode. That's what I inserted here. And I got out an implementation of that. Um, I'll show you what it looks like. Here. So, you see, this is what I give to hold for it to produce machine code for that function. 
Now if you, if you go forward, you see, I'm very restricted in this language. I have to write x2 dot blah blah x. Each line has to be something it has a machine code snippet to implement. So I can't, uh, I essentially had to do the register allocation. These names are very important. I couldn't use n there or x20 because it doesn't know x20. So this is very low level. Uh, but it could be done and this is, I felt at this at the end of this, I was very much stretching the, the entire framework. So what's a better way to compile a compiler? Oh. Compiler bootstrapping, right? So this is what we did then for KML. Uh, in, we essentially want to eval the term compile applied to some, something that is the compiler itself. And now I'll skip ahead a bit quickly. So uh, then, I mean, Jitao was done, verified list implementation for Prover was done. And then uh, came Ramana Kumar, who was interested in PhD and was interested in, KK, uh, in ML. And Scott and I had started on KML a little bit earlier. And we wanted an implementation of, of uh, KML, the language. And uh, how do you do that? How do you get a good compiler out of it? So we, we tried this for the first time then to bootstrap a compiler inside the logic. And this talk, I won't have time to get into how it was done. But I want to tell you that tomorrow uh, we, we have the next iteration of the KML compiler. So what was on in the previous uh, page was a very simple compiler. Now we're actually getting to a very good one with 12 intermediate languages, five target architectures, register allocation, and a uh, lot of fancy stuff. Uh, it's not like a state-of-the-art compiler, but it's trying to be realistic now instead of these super simple bytecode ones. Okay, and this is again more people involved. So looking back, PhD result and so forth. Now, of course, in retrospect, you can kind of arrange everything in a slightly more linear order and explain how we got there. And so. Reasoning, autom automation, garbage collection, synthesis, list interpreters, verified just-in-time compilation, then this result, then verified compiler bootstrapping, and who knows. That's all for me. Let's thank the speaker. Uh, we certainly have time for a fair amount of questions. Uh, I have a question. So how do you does your model of real world ISAs go? So, for example, is the x86 MMU model Turing complete? Yeah. There's no MMU for the x86. So, all of the models we use are from Anthony Fox. Uh, well, currently for KML at least. This one, I had written most of the x86 model, and it, that one was very simple. Uh, so they vary in, in complexity. So I know that his model for uh, risk can boot uh, FreeBSD. So it's, uh, that's, that's a quite proper one. <laughs> uh, ARM is also uh, quite complete in terms of instruction set, although it doesn't go into the MMU and so forth for the ARM one. But I think the same techniques would work. You just sometimes have to make assumptions about the state of these other things. Was Jitawa eventually made faster? For this use case, at least? No, it wasn't. <laughs> Although I have this uh, vague plan of using KML's... Uh, sorry. This one. The, this one is split up in so many languages that if you compile a list to one of the intermediate languages, I think you'd get a much better implementation out of that. What about those features that you decided not to try to implement during the negotiation? <laughs> Have you thought any more about those? You know, could you do the mutation for hash tables and stuff like that? Would you be able to handle those sorts of things with this approach? Or is that just out of, you know, just can't, can't handle it? I think it could be done. Uh, so, so I think the, the mutation, definitely. Uh, hash tables, and again, I'd like to use this one because this one allows mutation. 
uh, while uh, it made the proofs more complicated. Uh, I mean, it does make the proofs complicated here as well, but we've already solved that problem here. So I think it would be much easier now to have things like that. Uh, to do checkpointing, possibly, with, it might be possible, just store everything, load everything. Uh, timing, no. <laughs> I, I, or I could produce a number, but I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> How do you uh, handle arithmetic overflows? Uh, is that ways to undefined state? Uh, no. Uh, so I check for arithmetic overflow. And then it comes out as one of those error messages. You know, it could always say, or error. And then it would say, uh, it hit some kind of resource bound. Although for this one we have big num arithmetic. So uh, I mean you can do a factorial of 5000 it will spew out numbers. Is there anything about the type system of NL that makes it easier or harder to deal with than that list? Uh, so Scott is the expert on the type system for this work, but I could say that it's much easier to make Jitawa fast than it is to make KML fast. Uh, at least that's my... So for instance, in KML you, or in ML in general, you take one argument at a time uh, in the semantics. While in Jitawa, you have to call the function with the right num number of arguments, otherwise the semantics says crash. Um, and then it's much easier to do fast function calls. While here, you have to do a lot of work to get the function calls fast, and you still might not get it as fast as it could be. I guess it's worth noting that it's just the standard thing, right? In a type language, there is some, if you want to be safe, get on this, there is some checks you have to do, right? Is this thing I'm about to apply really a function? And in KML, we, we use the guarantees from the type system to elide those checks. So that should give us something. But then, yeah, the, at least for function calls, the one at a time function application totally wipes out. Yeah, that, that's a much bigger, harder thing to fix. We have a good story for it, but yeah, you just always took exactly the right number of arguments to lock it together. Yeah, maybe that's a, a silly question or maybe a point that I have missed in your presentation, but are you just focusing on sequential execution or are you also considering concurrency and then all the trouble with memory models and all these kind of things? This is all sequential. Okay, so, but how do you boot a free BSD which has threads and concurrency? No, that was, I think, a single-threaded. It wasn't a single-threaded, however, it was not very many threaded with sequentially consistent memory, so run one instruction to its completion, choose which thread to run next, run the next one. But I know a lot yeah. more about that part of the work. <laughs> and do you see a future where you will consider escaping from sequential execution? <laughs> uh, not in the immediate future, but, but yeah, it's, it's one of these things I think that, you know, Jared came and said to us, could you run this thing, and we, I, I, said, I thought it's a bit hopeless, but you know, a few late, years later it's, it's possible, so maybe we'll sort of take them off. And we and change listen. something regarding the proofs and uh, the kind of semantics you are using? Or yes. When you show the semantics of an instruction, you, you then assume that you have something in the memory, and uh, all this yes. will vanish. Oh, memory. yes, yes. The, the, the bottom part of the compiler will change significantly. Semantics, but I think the top level semantics shouldn't change hugely if you have if you're able to implement nice parallel uh, composition uh, printers. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what you want. You want a clean semantics at the top and then a, a fast, uh, crazy one at the bottom. <laughs> well, how, how to compose two horror triples? How to compose them? Uh, okay. Uh, So, to compose these, you have to make everything match. These already match. That one has to match that 
So you is instantiate that there, and then the i there gets instantiated, and then you get that expression. And then you can compose these two. You also have to frame that in. There's a, a rule which allows you to add something with a star at the end. And then once these these match exactly, then you can just merge them together. That's what you do. So uh, it's like antecedent, and uh, uh, the, the, it's like the, the is like uh, the, the type of the, 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 the instruction. Yes, this is describing the state here oh. at the end, and this describes the state at the start of this instruction. So if you if you can make these descriptions exactly match, you can combine. Combine so that you have something that if you, if you just don't look at these two, you can, it starts there and ends there. Do you have some I maybe I, I show you okay. offline. Yeah. I think we have time for one more quick question. If anyone has one, okay, let's thank like this again.